Why don't we stand for the reading of God's Word? We've been preaching through the Gospel of Mark, and we've made it now to chapter 10. And for the most part, we've been doing a chapter a week, although not always. And this will be another week where it's a not always. We're going to read verses 1 through 12 of Mark chapter 10. Scripture says, Then he arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan. And multitudes gathered to him again, and as he was accustomed, he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, testing him? And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. In the house, his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. So Jesus said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. May God bless the reading of his word. The title of my sermon this morning is God's First Great Intent of Marriage. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Lord, we thank you that you have preserved your scriptures down through the years so that we might study them and know your ways and your thoughts. And Lord, as we look at this important matter of divorce and remarriage here this morning, I ask and pray Father, that you would use the preaching of your word for good, that it causes each one to become studiers of your word, to dig deeper in it, to know your ways and your thoughts. And just use what is said here today for good in each of our lives and in regards to our union with our spouse. Lord, I just ask and pray that our marriages would be lived in utter devotion to you and to each other. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You could be seated. It's worth noting that the region that this took place, where this topic came up about divorce, the region it took place, it says, was, on the, was in Judea on the other side of the Jordan. And this region was known as Perea and was under King Herod's rule. So it's important to note that perhaps the Pharisees may have desired to cause Jesus to say something about divorce and remarriage, which could be used to kill him, even as John the Baptist was killed because of what he had to say about Herod's marriage. Scripture does say in verse 2 that... They were testing him. In verse 3, after they asked the question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, Jesus answers, as he often answers when people are trying to set him up, he asks a question in response to their question. What did Moses command you? Verse 4, they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce. And two, dismiss her. Here they appeal to a passage in Scripture which was of huge debate during the time of Christ between two schools of thought known as the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel. Shammai being the more restrictive school of thought and the school of Hillel being the more liberal. The passage of Scripture they're referring to where Moses permitted, as they say, to write a certificate of divorce or a bill of divorce, is Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. So keep your finger in Mark and turn with me to Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. Let's just read this passage. It 
It says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, when she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, lady ain't doing too good, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies, he took her as his wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. If a husband found something that was unclean in his wife or unseemly in her, the Jews thought that they could therefore just divorce their wife. They were using this verse out of God's law as grounds for divorce for almost any reason at this time in history. The debate between the schools was what was grounds to initiate the divorce, and that's important to understand. What was the grounds to initiate divorce? Both schools had many reasons to justify the grounds for divorce, but the debate between the two schools was upon what was grounds to initiate the divorce. And the Hillel was the more liberal of the two schools, thinking that grounds to initiate divorce were just about any disliking of the man for the wife, including the burning of their toast. Literally. Literally. They listed these things out. And included making an unsavory dish, which the husband did not like. In verses 5 through 9, Jesus responds to the Pharisees and to these two schools of thought, to the thinking of the day, and he blows them away. He says in verses 5 through 9, And Jesus answered and said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Cleave to his wife. The Hebrew and the Greek there leave you with the image of like wet mud when it clumps together. Like glue sticking together. Man's cleaved to his wife. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus blows both schools of thought away and repudiates their man-made ideas by declaring the first great intent of marriage. That marriage was meant to be until death do us part. Amen? There are actually three great intents of marriage as revealed by Holy Scripture. And this is the first indissolubility. Marriage is meant to be forever until death do us part. The other two great intents was fidelity. You were only to have relations with your spouse and none other. You were only trying to win the affections of your spouse and none other. And the third great intent was children. Children. These are the three great intents as revealed by Scripture. And this is the first, namely indissolubility. Indissolubility is the first. Marriage was intended by God to be until death do us part. Jesus repudiates this easy divorcism, which was prevalent both in Jewish and Roman culture at this time, by appealing to God's created order. Man and woman become husband and wife and are joined to one another become one flesh, and then, in conclusion, after appealing to the created order, Jesus blasts his hearers with verse 10 and says, Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Amen? This was a huge blow to the multitudes listening because divorce was prevalent both in Jewish and Roman culture at this time. It was a culture of easy divorcism. When I marry people, one of the first things I tell them is, marrying people is the gravest thing I do as a minister. Funerals are one thing. The person's dead. Okay? 
You're able to use it as an opportunity to talk about the things of God to those who are still alive. When it comes to marriage, people are beginning a life together. It's huge. It's of grave consequence. Right now in America today, the average marriage, including Christian marriages, end in divorce half the time. 50% end in divorce. So far, I have married 35 couples. Since I've been a minister, only two have ended in divorce. That's way better than the national average. When I sit a couple down, the first thing I ask them is, and I ask each of them this, do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? That's my first question. And then my second question to them is, do you love the one you intend to marry? They both say yes, always. Always, they say that. And then I let them know, as long as you maintain those two elements, your marriage will make it through anything. Absolutely, make it through anything. But if one of you either gives up on God or gives up on your spouse, nothing can repair it, though all the king's men try to do so. You have to have those elements, love for God, love for your spouse. That commitment has to remain there. And your marriage will make it through anything, as God intended it to. Verses 10 through 12, the scripture says, In the house his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. So he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Both ways. Jesus, according to Mark's account, later was asked by his disciples about this, and he responds with strong words. Amen? These are strong words. Divorce your spouse and go marry someone else. You're guilty of adultery. Here we see how strongly God condemns divorce. And we see a clear warning for those who have a flippant attitude about it or who are contemplating it. Amen. But this is not all that Scripture or Christ has to say about divorce. We must remember that we must interpret Scripture in light of the whole of Scripture. Scripture with a big S interprets Scripture with a small S. In other words, a particular passage or verse must be seen in the whole light of God's Word. Therefore, those who would read this passage and say there is never a biblically justifiable reason for divorce simply based on this passage here, do err. We must look at the whole of God's Word. Now, I want to make five assertions regarding divorce and then summarize, give you a summary which will include a despicable expose on the current state of marriage in American Christianity. First, we see from Scripture that it is God's intent that marriage be indissoluble. This is my first of five assertions. First, we see from Scripture that it is God's intent that marriage be indissoluble, that it is until death do us part. And so it should be our intent as Christian people to live in accordance with His intent for marriage. Amen? If this is His great intent, that marriage be indissoluble, then it should be our intent as His people to keep our marriages indissoluble. Duh. Amen? Secondly, it is important to note that nowhere, nowhere in God's law is there legislation to divorce. This is huge. This is huge. Nowhere in God's law is there a process declared whereby you can divorce your spouse. Did you know that? People think that, you know, oh yeah, well God allowed divorce in the Old Testament. He made way for it. He allowed it, but he didn't make a way for it. Not in his law. Nowhere in God's law is there a process declared by where you can divorce your spouse. 
showing again God's intent that marriage be indissoluble. He didn't even make a way for it through his law. It's till death do us part. That's what God intends for marriage. God's law nowhere declares or legislates a process whereby you can divorce your spouse. Rather, the law of God simply addresses certain matters regarding divorce. Now listen to me. It is crucial to understand that, for instance, this passage of the Pharisees brought up from Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4, and the five other times divorce is mentioned in God's law, do not institute or approve of divorce. Rather, they merely treat it as a practice already known and existing. They do not institute or approve of divorce. Rather, they simply mention it and treat it as a practice already known and existing. As one scholar I read aptly put it, quote, that the divinely ordained marriage institution was regarded as inviolable in the Old Testament is borne out by the initial absence of any reference to the possibility of abrogating it. Amen? It's nowhere in God's law. There's a process given whereby you can divorce your spouse. Hence, as Jesus says in our text, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. They had turned it into a justification. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. The Jews had turned it into a justification for their willy-nilly divorces. But Jesus is making it clear here that God's law references it only because it was a man-made practice already known and existing among men. Because of their hardness of their heart, God's law references divorce. doesn't provide a process to accomplish it or to do it. It simply makes certain law regarding it as something that's already being done, that man's already brought into existence of his own accord. In the Matthew 19 account of our passage, Jesus says in verse 8, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. Permitted you to divorce your wives. It was acknowledged that it happens. It was never legislated for it to occur. And that's an important distinction. Permitted you to divorce your wives. And then he says this, but from the beginning, it was not so. God's great intent for marriage, what God's design for marriage is, it's till death do us part. It's indissoluble. Amen? indissoluble based on the appeal to God's created order and design from the beginning it was not so man concocted such schemes and so we see again from scripture that it is God's intent that marriage be indissoluble that it is until death do us part God's law never legislated such a process And so it should be our intent as his people, as Christian people, to live in accordance with his intent for marriage in regards to our own marriages. It should be until death do us part. Amen? Third, this is my third assertion regarding divorce and remarriage. Jesus does declare an exception for divorce on the grounds of sexual immorality. Again, He doesn't legislate a process for it to take place. He merely makes mention of something that's already being done. Jesus does declare an exception for divorce on the grounds of sexual immorality, both in Matthew 5.32 and in Matthew 19, verses 1 through 10. Let's look at the Matthew 19 passage. Turn with with me there, please. Matthew 19.
The scripture reads, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. This is Matthew's account of what took place and what was said. And great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? More specific question than what was asked in the Mark account. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Because this was the debate between the Shammai school and the Hillel school. The Hillel school said, yeah, any reason. You know, whatever. She left her dirty socks under the bed. Ah, I can get rid of her. The Shammai school said, A divorce, although they had many reasons for it, it could only be initiated based on sexual immorality, matters of sexual immorality. Jesus answers and says to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Again, here, Christ Brings up the create God's created order. Amen? A man and a woman become husband and wife. They're joined in holy matrimony. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. This was Jesus is nailing what God's great intent was. What God has joined together, let not man separate. That wasn't in the Genesis account that he's quoting. Jesus is saying this. What God has joined together, let not man separate. He's letting them know this is what God's great intent for marriage was. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? So they're trying to justify their sin. Man's good at that, ain't he? And he always tries to do that. And they're even using God's law to try to justify their willy-nilly divorces. Jesus said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Verse 9 has it's known as the exception clause. Matthew 5.32 has the same exact words, and the same exception clause. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Some try to say that this passage here, in regards to the exception clause, is dealing with betrothal. They base this belief on the betrothal process laid out in the Old Testament that, you know, you were assigned to get this woman. And um, once you had agreed that you were going to marry, you were to have no other. You were quasi-married. The marriage just hadn't been consummated. And that's when the actual marriage would take place once the marriage was consummated. So they base this belief on the betrothal process laid out in the Old Testament and they use Matthew 1, 18 and 19 as an example where Joseph was going to put away Mary quietly. They translate the Greek word porneia, which is the word for sexual immorality here in our English translation. They translate the Greek word porneia as fornication and say that it refers to premarital sex only as in sex after betrothal, but before the actual marriage. There's three huge problems with this view. Number one, nowhere does the context in Matthew 19 suggest that sex during the betrothal process is what is being addressed here. You have to impose that idea upon the text. In fact, given the Given what Jesus was addressing at that time and the debate that was at that time, it was clearly willy-nilly divorces of any and every kind 
that were being addressed here. People who had consummated their marriages. Nowhere does the context of Matthew 19 suggest that sex during the betrothal process is what is being addressed here. You have to impose that idea upon the text. That's your first problem. The second problem is, is the Greek word used for divorce here, both by the Pharisees in verse 3 and by Christ in verse 8, is apaluo, which is the legal term used for divorce during the time of Christ. It would include, but clearly not be limited to, the betrothal situation. It would include the betrothal situation, but it would clearly not be limited to the betrothal situation. The only way you could limit it to that is if the context limited to it, and the context does not. And the third big problem you have is that porneia is not only translated fornication, and does not only refer to premarital sex, including premarital sex after betrothal, but before the actual marriage, porneia includes all forms of sexual immorality, not just sexual intercourse, including bestiality, incest, homosexuality, and so forth. Porneia is used in regards to all of these, all of which, you might note, are capital crimes in God's law. The conclusion is betrothal is not in the text here. That this is what Jesus was addressing here is not provable. Those who want to say that there is no reason ever for divorce to take place want to make it a betrothal thing here because they want to do away with the exception clause. But the conclusion is betrothal is not in the text here that this is what Jesus was addressing here, is not provable. And actually, some wonder, well, why did he use porneia instead of adultery? Why not use the word adultery? Why use the word porneia? I believe porneia was the better word to use rather than adultery because it mitigates against Bill Clinton-type thinking. You know, Bill Clinton-type thinking, which would say that, well... I didn't commit adultery because I didn't have sexual intercourse with that woman. Just oral sex. You know how many people think like that? And cheat on their spouses and betray God over and over again? Yeah. Porneia covers any and all sexual immorality, which is adultery for any married person to participate in, with any other than their spouse. Amen? Jesus' exception also makes sense in the light of God's law. Adultery was punishable under God's law by death. Hence, the offended party was free to remarry because the offending party was dead! Amen? At this time in history, during the time of Christ... The death penalty for adultery being enforced was virtually unheard of. The woman taken in adultery was a rare exception. And of course, the reason they brought her was they were trying to trap Jesus, right? And put him on the spot. You'll note that in that account, Jesus did not repudiate God's law regarding the death penalty for adulterers. Rather, he simply chose to address the hearts of the accusers. At this time in history, during the time of Christ, the death penalty for adultery being enforced was virtually unheard of. A writing of divorcement had become the common practice to deal with adultery at the time of Christ. A writing of divorcement had become the common practice of dealing with adultery at the time of Christ. In fact, in 30 A.D., the death penalty for adultery was abolished by the Jews. Usually something has long since not been enforced before it is officially abolished. We've even seen that in American jurisprudence, haven't we? Usually something has long since not been enforced before it is officially abolished. Such was the case here. 
Jesus' exception makes perfect sense in the light of God's law, and it's not being upheld and implemented. In a just society, the offending party would be put to death. The one committing adultery would be put to death, leaving the offended party free to remarry. We live in such a corrupt culture now, the offended party has no recourse whatsoever at law and is usually raked over the coals. In fact, I was watching cops the other night, and here's a guy, and the cop's bullying the guy around, because he got upset because his wife is with her lover. And so he got in a tiff about it, and supposedly made some threatening comments, and here's the cop there to arrest him, and take him to jail for acting like a man. Trying to intervene in the situation. That's how corrupt our culture is. In a just society, the offending party would be put to death, leaving the offended party free to remarry. So with Jesus' exception, the offended party is free to divorce and remarry since the offending party is no longer being put to death. Amen? Makes sense. I submit to you that if adultery is not grounds for divorce, it trivializes just how abhorrent a sin it is. Ponder that. And I could give you a long, cruel history of perversion and injustice that took place in Christian cultures, Christian in name but not in practice, which forbade divorce and remarriage for any reason. Forbade divorce and remarriage for any reason. I can give you a long, perverted, unjust, cruel history when that's imposed on a nation. My fourth assertion regarding divorce and remarriage is that those who say that one can only divorce and not remarry, even if they have biblically justifiable grounds for divorce, are wrong. Nowhere does Jesus say that those who are part of the exception clause cannot remarry. Nowhere does Jesus say they cannot remarry. And the full assumption in Christ's day was that if a divorce was justifiable, then being eligible to remarry was assumed. Even here in verse 9 of Matthew 19, Look what Jesus says. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The assumption is that if you cannot remarry for unbiblical grounds for divorce, you obviously can remarry for biblically justifiable grounds of divorce. Remember, the offending party should be dead, which leaves you free to remarry. My fifth assertion regarding divorce concerns 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15, where the Apostle Paul allows for one more very restrictive reason for divorce, namely that the unbelieving spouse divorces the believer. The unbelieving spouse divorces the believer. Okay? You got that right? Unbelieving divorces believing. This is commonly known as abandonment. The unbelieving spouse abandons the believing spouse. And unfortunately, over the last 50 years, the definition for what constitutes abandonment has been greatly expanded. Turn with me there to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15, and let's just see what the verse says plainly on its face. But if the unbeliever departs, verse 14 says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. 
It's abandonment. They leave. Unfortunately, over the last 50 years, the definition for what constitutes abandonment has expanded greatly. And it's amazing that as our culture at large departs from God's norm regarding marriage, the church seems to follow right along with it. Just follow our laws over the last 50 years and follow the divorce rate amongst Christians. Rather than setting the standard, they're just following the flow. Abandonment does not mean that you have been abandoned because he or she isn't having sex with you. There's no grounds for divorce. You can't claim abandonment just because your spouse isn't having sex with you. Now, your spouse has a duty. God forbid that it's a duty, but it is a duty to have sex with you. Amen? Scriptures are clear on that. Verses 3 through 5 of this very chapter says, Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time. In other words, you both agree to it. That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You do have a duty to have sex with your spouse. But just because your spouse isn't having sex with you is no grounds for divorce. You haven't been abandoned. It does not mean you've been abandoned because he or she... Your spouse is being physically abusive to you. And I say he or she because, man, there's some women with a good right hook. It's not always the guy. It's prevalently the guy. It's not always the guy doing physical abuse. So I say he or she. Abandonment does not mean, it does not mean you've been abandoned because you're being physically abused. You could separate for a time, to protect yourself and the children for a time. But physical abuse is not grounds for divorce. The offending spouse can be charged with the crime. They can be brought under church discipline. Allow these things to work in the person's life. If they persist in their bad behavior, what will usually end up happening is, is they'll either end up divorcing you and then you have the true case of abandonment or I've even seen it where God takes people out. But you have a duty to be faithful to Him. Amen? And you have no grounds to divorce your spouse because of physical abuse. You have a duty to protect yourself as severe as the case may be, but you have no grounds for divorce. Abandonment, it, abandonment, it does not mean you've been abandoned because your emotional needs aren't being met or because you're emotionally abused. My word, do you know how many ways people can get out of a marriage with that label? What is emotional abuse? It's one thing to one person and another to the next, isn't it? There's no grounds for divorce based on I'm emotionally abused. Fight back! <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, hon. <laughs> Fight back. <laughs> oh, let's see here. Where am I? <laughs> It does not mean you've been abandoned because your emotional needs aren't being met or because you're emotionally abused and a host of other nonsense excuses for divorce that have come under the heading of abandonment. The exception here is very limited to exactly what it says. And it's a C-spot run type of thing, isn't it? This exception is very limited, as is the one Christ gave. It simply means you do not have to go chasing after the unbelieving spouse and try to force them to remain married to you if they leave and divorce you. 
Amen? You don't have to go chasing them down. Oh, please, please, no, no. You know, this type of thing. You did not put your hand to the divorce. They divorced you. You are not under bondage. Again, nowhere does Scripture say you cannot remarry in such situations. And again, the thinking of the day was that if a divorce is justifiable, then remarriage is assumed allowable. Remarriage after divorce for any reason other than these two reasons, these two limited restrictive reasons, is not an option. Remarriage after divorce for any other reason than these two reasons given for divorce is not an option. Matthew 10, our passage today, makes that clear. Matthew 5 makes that clear, where the exception clause is. Matthew 19 makes that clear, where the exception clause is. Any other reason you get divorced for, you're not to remarry. Period. Luke 16 makes that clear. Everywhere Jesus talks about divorce, all make it clear remarriage is not an option. It's only an option in regards to those two limited restricted exceptions given by Scripture. Now let me give you my summary. Those were my five assertions regarding divorce. Now let me give you my summary regarding the state of our nation and American Christianity when it comes to marriage. Compare what God's intent was for marriage till death do us part and how as Christian people that should be our intent and these two very limited restrictive exceptions we find in Scripture. Compare that to the present day reality of divorce amongst Christians in America today. Half of all marriages end in divorce nationwide, and it is no different among Christian people. Fifty percent end in divorce. And compare God's great intent and these two limited restrictive exceptions to the plethora of ridiculous reasons Christians give to divorce one another today. How about Amy Amy Grant? She saw some other country singer who she thought looked good who she felt God had for her to be her soulmate. And so she divorced her husband, left her kids, and went and married this other guy. And half of Christendom thinks, it's okay, Amy. That's no big deal. That's no problem. We'll still fellowship with you. We'll still have you on our TV show. We'll still bring you into our church to sing. Richard Roberts, you want to go back another decade? Oral Roberts' son. His old dad helped orchestrate his divorce just because he saw a woman he liked better than the woman he was married to. And he wanted her. Or we could just take the news from this past week and talk about all the willy-nilly reasons Christians are divorcing each other. Just, just the news from this week. How about Juanita Bynum? She's a female preacher, national ministry, whose husband also is a preacher, and he's got a national ministry. Hers bigger than his. He was accused of assaulting her. They got in a fight in the parking lot of a hotel. It's happened month and a half ago or so. Here's what the story says from Fox News, September 13th, 2007. Televangelist Juanita Bynum's husband, accused of assaulting her, will not contest her petition for divorce after all, his attorney said Thursday. The Reverend Thomas W. Weeks III had held out hope that he and Bynum could reconcile even after she filed a petition for divorce. Yeah, he held out a hope. Because physical abuse is no justification for divorce. Monday, uh, petition for divorce Monday, but now, quote, has come to the personal resolve that if Juanita is insistent on a divorce, he will not stand in the way. Unquote, his attorney said in a statement. 
Bynum's attorney, Carla Walker, said she is withdrawing a divorce petition filed in South Georgia, Ware County, where Bynum has a home, and refiling the case in Gwinnett County, where Weeks lives. So, the divorce is continuing. Bynum, known for her message of female empowerment, how many of you are aware I've ever seen her speak, by the way? I have. What it come down to here is, the guy had a horsey wife, and he just got sick of it. He got frustrated, and they ended up in a physical altercation. Oh, we know that's such taboo in our culture today. He had a horsey wife, and he just got sick of it. Bynum, known for a message of female empowerment, claims weeks choked pushed and stomped on her in a hotel parking lot after August, after an August 21st meeting in which the couple failed to reconcile, I guess so. Yeah, they failed there. Boys. Weeks faces charges of aggravated assault making terroristic threats. He is free on $40,000. Bynum is not allowed to have contact with Bynum. Bynum, 48, is head of a dynamic ministry that also includes a gospel record label and seminar tours. She has sold thousands of motivational books, CDs, and DVDs related to empowerment and marriage. She has now emerged as a self-appointed, quote, face of domestic violence, and she appointed herself. She's divorcing her husband, held a big press conference, and now she's on a campaign to help further empower women to help further divide families, to help further destroy marriages. I always tell people this. When you invite the state into your marriage, 99.9% of the time, it's a death knell for the marriage. The state doesn't bring families together. They push families further apart. Sometimes the state does need to be brought in because of the actions of some, however. But it should be done so gravely. She has now emerged as a self-appointed face of domestic violence and says she wants to be seen as a survivor, not a victim of abuse. Oh, please. That's important to make those distinctions. I'm a survivor, not a victim. Weeks, 40, is known to his followers as Bishop Weeks and is head of Global Destiny Ministries based in the Atlanta suburb of Duluth. He co-wrote, Teach Me How to Love, <laughs> The Beginnings. Well, first you choke the person, <laughs> throw him on the ground and stomp up and down on him, you know. This is, these are the people we have, you know, that are out there in front of the public as Christians. Yeah, they love the drama, I know. With Bynum and the two wed, uh, the two wed in a million dollar televised ceremony in 2002. You thought the people you know who spent 20 grand were out of their mind? <laughs> These people spent a million bucks. And five years later, they're stomping on each other and divorcing each other. He put the word out there, said said he was open for reconciliation, Custer said. I guess he got no positive response. At this point, he's not going to fight whether or not there's going to be a divorce. So there's one. There's one. Uh, This was also in the news this week. Paula White, I'm not going to draw back. Remember I talked about this recently? Randy and Paula are getting divorced. Well, listen to this story. Quote, oh, pardon me. Loud applause greeted famed life coach and female televangelist Paula White at her first public appearance, her first public interview since the announcement of her divorce. White appeared on the Trinity Broadcasting Network this week as both a guest and preacher, touching on the highly public divorce she's going through while encouraging others not to be swayed by life's trials. Quote, I embrace the concept that I would not let my trial be wasted in life, said White on a show hosted by contemporary Christian music artist Carmen. Burn any albums of his you have. (laughs) Need something to stomp on? 
Don't do your spouse. <laughs> do Carmen's records. <laughs> CDs, DVDs, whatever. Stomp up and down on those. Hosted by contemporary Christian music artist Carmen that aired Wednesday and Thursday. Quote, I often say I didn't write the script, but I'm learning to live it out with the best of my ability for the honor of God, with dignity, with grace, with favor, embracing his word. It's like, now, wouldn't your average person with a three-pound brain in their head be thinking to themselves, this woman's ready for the loony ward. She's involved in divorcing her husband, and she's acting like she's just some bystander, and it's just, ta- it's just happening to her. Like, she doesn't have any role to play. It's, she's a victim, you know? A survivor. There's a trial going on here. A trial. Paul and Randy White, co-founders and former co-pastors of Without Walls International in Tampa, Florida, one of the fastest-growing churches in the nation, one of the fastest-growing churches in the nation, announced their decision to split at a Thursday evening service late last month. Married nearly 18 years, the couple blamed the two different directions their lives were going. Both have been divorced before. So we got a lady divorcing her husband because of physical um, abuse. Here we have two people who like, you know, we're, our lives are just going in two separate directions. So <laughs> we're thrown in the towel. And boy, what a trial it is. But I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to be better from it. And I'm going to teach you. <laughs> <laughs> Quoting what Jan Crouch, bastion of theological prowess she is, Quoting what Jan Crouch, co-founder of TBN, had once told her, Paula White said, quote, You know who you are, and you know whose you are. Ooh, now this is some, phew, some heavy-duty stuff here. Notice the focus throughout this story on me, myself, and I. On you. Not God. It's all about the person. And God's just there to make the person's life a little more enjoyable, a little bit better, and all this type of nonsense. You know who you are, and you know whose you are. Quote, I say this for Randy, my former husband, she continued. And Randy is a man of God. No one sets their life out and says, boy, this is what I think I'm going to go through. And people look at things as failure. Why didn't this work? But I see 18 years of the rock that I was healed from, and I'm grateful for the seasons in my life because I wouldn't be who I am without all the people that God has used to help me, to develop me, to cultivate me. Some of the greatest development in the men and women of God were those in adverse situation, those in opposition, White added. This woman nuts. She's acting like she's just watched a train wreck and she's just standing on the side. She is the train wreck. You know what I'm saying? Trying to act like this is just some trial that came upon her. You know, my car got wrecked. There was an accident. One of my kids died or something like that. And trying to apply it to her, putting her hand to divorcing her husband. Is this mental case stuff? And then there's so many dopey Christians in the world that they're still able to bring in millions? Yeah. Scary as it is. Quote, but it pulled out, but it pulled out because you had that decision, whatever that means. You can either gravitate and put your hand to the plow. This is what she's saying. You can either gravitate and put your hand to the plow and say, okay, God, I don't get this one. I don't even like this one. But still, what do you have to say to me? I will not be moved. Is this woman insane? Trying to put the onus on God, like God's moved her into this divorce and she has nothing to say about it. You know what I mean? Like it's an uncontrollable, I'm just going along. God got me. You know? Oh, I don't like this one, God. 
I don't know where this one came from. Okay. The woman has lawyers. She has to put her name on documents. She's doing it because she wants to. She can stop at any time she wants to. And yet she's trying to make it out like she's just some victim being dragged along against her will. White is releasing a new book in October that she says contains contents from her personal journals and that it exposes, quote, the innermost of my being. It's all about Paula. And that's how it is with 90% of American Christians. It's all about me. In You're All That, that's the name of the book. You're All, you're all That. Understand God's design for your life. White talks about discovering, quote, who you are in Christ. All about me. That's why divorce is okay. God is a nice little furry puppet that exists for me. You know, he's a little teddy bear. He wants me to feel good. I don't like Randy anymore. Randy don't like me anymore. We're going different directions. So God is for this because it's what we want. It's what will make us happy. And there's still enough dopey Christians in America that they bring millions in. Quote, because when you know who you are and whose you are, thank you, Jan Crouch, I believe it gives you that inner fortitude and that strength to face whatever life situation you may have to go through, said White on the show. Quote, when I don't understand life, I'm not going to draw back. I have decided to do one thing, even to do one thing, even my mind doesn't comprehend it. Draw nigh, she said. <laughs> I believe when people can find out who they are, then you can be equipped to handle life situations. You know how many women, Christian women in America, feed on this woman's insanity and think that she is sane? And then we wonder why there's so many problems in marriages around America? Give me a break. And the junk the men are spewing forth is just as rotten. News of the trouble in the whites' marriages was first picked up by the Tampa Tribune in May, blah, 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 criticism still, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so still with her divorce taking place in the public eye, White said, everything, quote, everything God brings me through, I promise him I will hold my hand out to someone else and allow myself to say, he lifted me through this, he'll lift you through this. Guess she's got a new ministry. Help people make it through their divorces. They're willy-nilly. I can divorce for any reason divorces. Oh, was it here? Carmen was saying some real dopey stuff somewhere in here, too. I'm shocked. Oh, aware of the critics, Christian artist Carmen said people who don't have the wherewithal to assess the situation should not judge. Or, quote, open that person up to a look, unquote, as he stated it. He told Paula White that she's at the top of her game right now. Yeah. I bring this up to show you the state of American Christianity in regards to marriage. I've talked about how the three great intents of marriage have been abrogated by the Christian church in America repeatedly. Ad nauseum, obnoxiously. Childlessness. One of the three great intents of, God's, of God for marriage is children. To have them. And we have a Christianity hell-bent on having as few as possible or to obtain childlessness. Fidelity, the immorality rate, Amongst Christians is the same as amongst pagans in this country. And indissolubility, the divorce rate, 
is the same amongst Christians as it is amongst pagans in this country. I view what TBN is doing here as so important that if I lived in Southern California, I would follow Mr. Crouch around, Paul Crouch around, to expose the evil that he's propagating everywhere he went. That's how strongly I feel about it. Him and his son have done more to corrupt Christianity around the entire world. And they've infected millions with a bogus Christianity. And this is the Christianity that's supposed to be alive unto God. Yeah. While a great portion of the rest is dead unto God, the one that's supposed to be alive unto God is spewing this type of nonsense. Compare what God's intent was for marriage till death do us part and how as Christian people that should be our intent and these two very limited restrictive exceptions we find in Scripture to the present day reality of divorce amongst Christians in America today. The early church was not like this. They viewed the indissolubility of their marriage as a defining characteristic of Christian marriages. They were a beacon of light in a dark world. Did you hear me on that? They viewed the indissolubility of their marriages as a defining characteristic of what it meant to be a Christian and to have Christian marriage. They were a beacon of light in a dark world. In fact, when you read the writings of some who converted to Christianity in the early church, it was because of what they saw in Christian marriages that they converted to Christ. The early Christians saw this as an opportunity Remaining together till death do us part because divorce was so rampant in the secular culture at large. In other words, this made the early church more intent on being holy and living in accordance with God's great intent for marriage. Whereas today in America, the church has embraced the world's thinking regarding divorce. Rather than being a beacon of light, has become a murky pool. Even when it comes to these two limited restrictive exceptions, we should do all we can not to divorce, but rather work through them. Adultery, you should try to reconcile. Is there repentance by the offending party? If there is, you should try to reconcile. Abandonment. You should try to win the unbelieving spouse. Some of you in this congregation have. Don't move on until all hope is lost of the divorcing spouse. Like they remarry. Deuteronomy 24 would then apply. Jesus' declarations about divorce were radical to those who lived in his days on earth. That's why in Matthew 19.10, the disciples said, better that a man not marry. (laughs) If that's the case, it was radical. If Jesus' view on divorce and remarriage were taught in today's churches, there would be far fewer divorces amongst believers. Marriage would be entered into gravely, as I say to all couples I marry. There would be more caution more circumspectness when entering into marriage, and couples would commit themselves to making their marriage work. For remarriage after divorce would not be an option for most of the divorces taking place amongst Christians today. Yeah. Take away the remarriage card. You'd be surprised how many people would buck up and ante up and work their way through it. May our marriages remain strong and be a beacon of light in a dark nation. I say that to all of you who are married here this day. Let's stand up. We'll close in a word of prayer. Lord, we give thanks and praise to you. We rejoice in you. We thank you that you preserved your scriptures so we can study them. And Lord, I just ask and pray that we would 
live true to you. Lord, may our marriages not just be something that we endure. And God made this hard thing. But Lord, may each one here taste just how great holy matrimony is. Lord, I pray for each marriage here that it continues to grow in you and that each one grows closer to each other in their marriage. Father, I just ask and pray that each one would taste just how great your design is in regard to marriage and the family. Lord, so many have been deprived or robbed of tasting of just how glorious your design is. And Lord, I ask and pray that you bring healing, restoration, reconciliation, so that they might taste of it. As they follow your intent for marriage in all three areas, indissolubility, fidelity, and children, O oh God. As they do that, may they see just how wonderful marriage and the family is by your design for mankind. And I ask for these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It could be seated. We're going to take communion at this time. So if you'd like to take communion with us, it's okay to do as long as you're a believer. If you've repented and put faith in Christ, you can take communion with us. If you haven't, we ask that you not take communion because this is something that is for God's people alone. We take communion every week at Mercy Seat, and we do that for a number of reasons. One is the tradition of the church to do so. So we follow in that pattern laid out by the early church, and we observe his table every week. We also do it because we're not to eat unworthily. If we have conflict with other brothers and sisters in Christ, we're supposed to try to work that conflict out before we sit down and partake at the Lord's table. We can't always work the conflict out. Because people are people, and where there's people, there's idiots. But we at least have an opportunity or a duty to try to work it out. Amen? And by having communion every week, if, we have an, if we're offended by a brother, have a conflict with a brother, by having communion every week, it forces us to go take care of that quickly. You know, if you just do it once a month or once every three months or six months, there's a more opportunity to let things grow inside you so you start talking to other people rather than the one you're supposed to be talking to, right? So it's good for that reason that we take communion every week. And we also do it because we need to be reminded of God's great salvation. Amen? That it's always only through Christ that we obtain right standing with God. Man, in all his religiosity, always wants to think it's Jesus plus something I've done that gives me right standing with God. Even after we become Christians, we have this tendency. It's something I've done. It's Jesus plus something I've done that gives me right standing with God. And this time at his table, it reminds us, no, it's through Christ alone that we have right standing with God. Because there's only two elements at his table. The bread, which represents his body, and the fruit of the vine, which represents his shed blood, and absolutely nothing else. Amen? It isn't these two elements plus the list of how many hours I spend in prayer, how many people I witness to. Now, when you know Christ, you'll want to spend hours in prayer and you'll want to witness to people. But the point is, you can't use those things as a means whereby you try to approach God. We can always only approach God through Christ because of what He did when He died on the cross. Whether we've been a Christian for five seconds or 55 years. The good things which we do, and when you become a Christian, good things will follow in your life. Amen? The good deeds that we do, the holy living that we display, those things are simply the fruit, the result, the evidence of our saving faith in Christ. They don't give us right standing with Christ. We do good things not to try and obtain God's acceptance. Rather, we do good deeds because we have obtained God's acceptance. Amen? Amen? And there's a world of difference between the two, and it's important that we don't get the cart before the horse. Let's pray. Lord, we rejoice in you and give thanks to you for this great salvation. 
We pray that we would make it known to others, Lord. Father, even those who are living in misery right now in ruined marriages or going through divorce and the severe heartache that that brings. Father, I just ask and pray that we'd be able to bring them this good news. Jesus and Him crucified. Hallelujah, God. Lord, I pray that we would declare Your holy law and this great salvation to others. That they would see their need for Your Son, Jesus Christ, and bow the knee and begin to walk according to Your Word. Blessed be Your holy name. Hallelujah, God. We give thanks to You, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Let's partake together. Hallelujah. Let's stand up and we'll pray. Father, we rejoice in You and thank You that we were able to cover an important topic today. We thank You that we were able to gather together to worship You corporately. I ask, O Lord, that You watch over each one this coming week. Keep them safe. Use them for Your purposes. Lord, I ask that each man here would be a priest to his home and not shirk his responsibilities And be faithful in them, rather, and open your word to his wife and to his children, teaching them from your scriptures. Lord, help each woman to be a helpmate to her husband and a nurturer of the children. Help each child to be a blessing to their parents, not a curse. Father, we just ask and pray that each grandparent and great-grandparent be an example of Christian living to their progeny. And we ask all these things in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. God bless you.